Hello and welcome. My name is Stephanie Garner and I'm the program coordinator at Down Syndrome Indiana. Down Syndrome Indiana is a nonprofit and our mission is to enhance the lives of individuals with Down Syndrome. And we do that in a variety of different ways. We advocate, we connect, we advise, we educate, and many other things. One of the services that we provide is that we do an annual conference every year. And in 2020, thanks to COVID-19, we did have to cancel our in-person session, but we have decided to bring that conference to you in a virtual format. So this is our welcome presentation, so thank you for attending. I'm going to be talking a little bit and trying to set the stage for the presentations that are to come, and I'll also be talking about the different presentations that we have scheduled throughout the month of July. So if there's one that you were wondering if, if it would appeal to you or not, I can give you a little bit more information about that. So let's go ahead and get started. I did want to start by saying thank you to our sponsors about Special Kids, Family Voices Indiana, Mass Mutual, Midwest, and Mr. Gordon Holmes, and Shepherd's College. I encourage you to check out our virtual exhibit hall. So you are able to access our virtual exhibit hall at www.dsindiana.org forward slash virtual dash exhibit dash hall. We have a lot of great um, organizations who are exhibiting. In addition to contact information for those organizations, a lot of them have also shared um, a short video clip about what their organization does. So imagine what you would be talking to them about if you just stopped by their exhibit booth at an event. So definitely stop by and check those out. The topic of our conference this year is promoting independence for life. And we chose that topic because it's so applicable to everyone. Whether you have an eight month old, an eight year old, 18 year old, 28, 48 year old, there's something that you can be doing to help your loved one with Down syndrome or other intellectual disability um, live a more fulfilling and independent life. So we don't want the, this conference to, um, to make you feel guilty, like you're not doing enough, because the reality is all of us could be doing more to help our loved ones be a little bit more independent. But we'd like you to use this conference as a starting point to, um, to help your loved one down the road. So let this be day one of a more independent individual. So I thought that this cartoon was a really great way to start talking about independence. For those of you who may be just listening and not watching, um, it's a cartoon of a young man who's about 17. He's walking down a city street and he's wearing a harness um, like you might put on a dog or a toddler. And behind him holding the leash to the harness is his mom. And the caption says, but mom, I'm nearly 17. And I think that this is so appropriate for so many of us, especially those of us who are parents of children with special needs, with disabilities. We can very often harness our children completely, completely unintentionally, but we put a lot of not literal harnesses on our kids, hopefully, but we put a lot of figurative harnesses on there. We are holding them back in a lot of different areas that, that they may want to or need to be able to be a little bit more independent in. So as we move forward, there is a driving question, one that I want you to keep in the back of your mind throughout this entire month of presentations. And that question is, what is something that I currently do for my loved one that he or she could be doing for themselves? What I'd like you to do is take a couple minutes, and since you're watching this recorded, go ahead and pause this and take a few minutes and start writing down some notes. Grab a piece of paper, grab your phone and make some notes. Think, think of something, and if you're like me, maybe one thing turns into 10 things that you're currently doing for your loved one that he or she could be doing for themselves. So go ahead and pause and then come back when you're ready. Okay, I wanna assume that you are done with that. Normally when I do this presentation live, I would start a timer and give people about five minutes, but um, I will trust that you did that on your own. So most people, when they, um, when we do this presentation, 
they, I think, feel a little embarrassed. So usually the next thing that I do is I invite folks to share something that they might have on their list. And that's not to cause anybody embarrassment or to shame anyone, but quite the opposite. It's to let you know that you're not alone. I guarantee whatever you put on your list, somebody else has it too. So again, please, please, please don't feel guilty. That's not what this is about at all. But I want you to keep this list with you. Post it on your refrigerator. Um, you know, keep it somewhere that you're going to see it frequently and bring it with you to every conference session that you attend and add to that list as we move forward. The reality of life, the one guarantee, well, one of several guarantees that there are in life is that we're going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes all the time and we learn from them. And based on those experiences, we get better and we improve. And our loved ones with disabilities are no different. They're going to make mistakes and they're going to learn from those mistakes. But we know that individuals with intellectual disability, they take longer to learn things than you or I might. So while we might be able to make one or two mistakes and then figure something out, someone with an intellectual disability might take them a little bit longer. They might need to make a few more of those mistakes. So helping our loved ones be independent in, um, in a controlled setting that we are, are really helping with is huge and will make such a difference for our loved ones. So, um, Baby steps, we're starting slow when we're talking about independence, but this is really important. One of our presenters, Carly Shertino Poulter, is going to be talking about this very thing that making mistakes is an inherent part of being an adult. Um, and she's going to talk about the term dignity of risk, which is something that I, I find absolutely fascinating. So we're all going to make mistakes. And I know that as parents, as caregivers, as siblings, we want to protect our loved ones with disabilities. We want to keep them in a protective bubble and make sure that they're safe, that nobody's victimizing them, um, that they uh, aren't coming to any harm. I get that. I feel that as a parent. Uh, definitely. I want to do that. But we have to remember that when we keep our individuals really, 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 really safe and we put all of our eggs in that basket, then we sacrifice their independence. So for those of you who may be listening, uh, the graphic here is a scale like that you would weigh two items on. And on one side is independence and on the other side is safety. And when we think about safety and independence, they very often, um, kind of counteract each other. So when we really focus on letting our individual, our loved one with a disability be very, very independent, it can sometimes feel like we're sacrificing their safety. And conversely, when we're really focused on making sure that they're staying safe, we can really sacrifice their independence. So for each of us, we have to find that perfect balance between safety and independence is going to fit our loved one with with a disability. Um, every individual is going to be different. What works for me and my daughter with Down syndrome is gonna look different than what's gonna work for you <clears throat> and your loved one. And frankly, not only is it different from person to person, but it's different from situation to situation as well. So know that it's not perfect. There are times you're going to make mistakes and err on one side versus the other. Um, but starting to test those waters is really important. So I wanna come back to that driving question. So I had asked you, what is that one thing that you do for your loved one that he or she could be doing for themselves? And I want you to go back to the list that you came up with. Maybe it's just one thing, maybe it's 10 things, but I want you to pause the recording again and I want you to think about why. Why do you do those things for your loved one when he or she could be doing them for, your, for themselves? So take a few minutes and think about that and then come back. Okay, I'm gonna assume that you've done that and you've thought about it. So I talked earlier about the fact that there are a couple guarantees in life. One of them is that you're gonna make mistakes. Absolutely. Another one is that the only person, well, 
I'm, I'm taking liberties with this. I think the way that I've heard it is the only person whose attitude you control is your own. Um, I'm gonna kind of twist it and say the only person whose behavior you control is your own. Um, so when we are wanting to make changes in the level of independence that our loved one has, we need to not be thinking about what they can do differently, but what we can do differently. If I wanna see another behavior out of you, I need to figure out how do I provide different supports? What can I do differently to get something different from you? And so when we're thinking about all of those things that we do for our loved one, that he or she should be doing for themselves, um, we need to think about why we're doing those things because those are kind of barriers to that person's independence. Those are things for us that are keeping them from being more independent. So I sat down and I thought about all of the things on my list and, and what would be keeping my kiddo from being more independent? What would be keeping me from letting her be more independent? And I came up with three things that I'm going to call barriers to independence. So the first thing that I came up with was time constraints. So, you know, we live in a crazy busy world. You know, we don't have time for anything anymore. We're constantly going from one activity to the next and we're always rushing, rushing, rushing. So it's hard. I don't have time to teach my child how to do skills. And maybe sometimes I don't know and I don't have the time to learn how to teach my child or my loved one a skill. I'm gonna say child a lot, only because I have a child, but this applies to adults with Down syndrome as well. Um, it's faster when I do it. My loved one takes way too long, right? These are all really, really great reasons that I'm just gonna do it for myself. So once I can acknowledge that it is a time factor that's keeping my loved one from being able to be more independent because they take too long and I just end up having to do it myself. Then once I acknowledge that, then I can start to make some changes. Then I can start to make a plan. I can say, all right, just to give you one for my personal life, I can say, all right, you know, my daughter is eight years old and she absolutely can dress herself for school in the morning. Does she? No, because it takes her forever. By the time we get up, we get breakfast eaten and it's time to get dressed. I mean, we don't have all day. We have a limited amount of time and I can do it in this set amount of time, but if she does it, it's gonna take this amount of time. And so I'm gonna admit, I typically do it for her. Um, and so once I acknowledge that, then I can start to make some changes. Maybe we need to get up earlier the night before or the morning. <laughs> That morning. Maybe we get up earlier that morning so that we have a little bit of extra time. Maybe we do some of our morning routine the night before so that it gives us a little bit more time in the morning. There are things that we can do to, to fix it once we acknowledge what that barrier is. The next thing I came up with was the need for control. Um, many of us have certain things that only we can do right. The first thing that comes to my mind is the dishwasher. The only person who loads the dishwasher, right, is me. And so, um, and I think a lot of people feel that way, right? We want to do it the right way. So we do it ourselves. And it can be frustrating when you're trying to teach your loved one with Down syndrome how to do a task. And I don't know about your loved ones with Down syndrome, but my daughter, um, she has her own spunky little way of doing everything. And there are a lot of things that she just will not be taught. She knows the right way to do it. So that can be frustrating. Uh, bathrooms are another area that I've heard people have a lot of issues with. The bathroom has to be cleaned a certain way and only I do it well. So once we acknowledge that that's what our holdup is, then we can start figuring out what can we do about that? Maybe that means that you need to take a few steps back and reteach those skills. So maybe instead of having your loved one load the entire dishwasher, maybe they only load the silverware or maybe they only put plates in and you just go really slowly and make sure they get it exactly where you want. You can do the same thing with the bathroom. Maybe they have one area that's their assigned spot to clean. Um, the other alternative um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, is that maybe you start trying to let go of some of that control and acknowledge that yeah, maybe there are multiple ways 
to load a dishwasher. I'm not judging though, please know that I'm not judging. And the final barrier for independence that I came up with was my needs. Um, it is completely normal and natural for us as parents to want to feel needed. Uh, there are certain things that I do for my daughter that she could be doing for herself that I do because it makes me feel good. I like that she needs me. I like that she wants me. Um, and I, it feels a need in me to do this stuff for her. She's my baby. She's my only baby. Um, but again, once we acknowledge that that's really the driving force which behind why I do it, then I can start to realize that I need to get those needs met elsewhere so that my loved one can be a little bit more independent. So next, I wanna go ahead and talk about our speakers and we'll just run through these really quickly. So first off, on Tuesday, July the 7th from 12 to 1, we've got Melissa Keys. And Melissa is the Executive Director of Indiana Disability Rights. Melissa is going to be talking about what to know about supported decision making and other options. So supported decision making is an alternative to guardianship. Now, I know once I say that, a lot of people get totally turned off and say, nope, I'm, I don't need to tune into that at all um, because we've got guardianship and that's the way it needs to be. And that's totally okay. If your loved one needs guardianship, that is absolutely all right. And that's one of the things Melissa will talk about. But um, it is possible to have guardianship of your loved one and still utilize a supported decision-making model. So I encourage you just listen and learn more about it. It's a really cool concept. Our uh, second presentation is, from the Erskine, is about the Erskine Green Training Institute. Mr. Fenway Park will be our presenter for that. And uh, Fenway is the recruitment specialist at Erskine Green Training Institute. And that will be on Thursday, July the 9th from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And that presentation is going to be about Erskine Green, but it's also going to be about the, the requirements that they have for attending their program and um, some of the reasons that folks get turned away, like what independent living skills they see most lacking in their applicants. And if you're the parent of a younger child like me, I love looking at their admission, like independent living skill requirements, because I think it's a really good, um, a really good guide for us to be able to, to move towards as our kids get older to know that those are some of the things we need to be striving for like waking up to an alarm independently so it ought to be a really great presentation next up we have the importance of high expectations for families of children with disabilities what does the research say and what should we do? This presentation is by Katie Heron, and Katie is the research associate with early childhood, the Early Childhood Center at the Indian Institute on Disability and Community. And her research is really, really interesting. I heard Katie present at the Indiana Governor's Council a couple of years ago, and it was fascinating. Um, so she's going to be talking about your expectations and um, why it's so important to set high expectations, why it's important for you to have those expectations and to make sure that educators and the other people in your child's life have those high expectations as well. Next, we have Skill Building Across the Lifespan. That's going to be by Jade Presnell on Thursday, July 16th from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And Jade is a behavior consultant with Insights Consulting. So she is going to be really telling you what to do next. So you've got this list that we've started today about things that you need to be working on to improve the independence of your loved one. And so Jade is going to be telling you how you do that. Because if you're like me, it feels really daunting to have this task and know I need to teach this to my child, but where in the world do I even begin? And that's what Jade's going to be talking about. And so this is going to be fabulous, whether you have a little one with Down syndrome or an adult with Down syndrome, I think that you're going to get something from this presentation. Next up, we have Phil Clark. 
talking about how to plan for future independence. And Phil is the founder and president of Enable Special Needs Planning. Phil is also a sibling of a beautiful young lady with Down syndrome. And they are going to, or he is going to be rather talking to us, not, not just about the financial preparation for the future, um, but also about setting the stage. So how do you talk to siblings? Who's going to be guardian of your child when you're no longer there? Um, how do you have those conversations? What kind of things do you need to set up? So that's going to be on Tuesday, July 21st from 12 to 1. And next we have a presentation by Dr. Cassie Carlson. And that is trouble with transitions when mood and anxiety symptoms get in the way. That's on Thursday, July the 23rd from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And Dr. Carlson is the Assistant Professor of Clinical Psychiatry at the IU School of Medicine. So she's going to be talking about some of the mental health issues that can affect our loved ones with Down syndrome from really reaching that level of independence that we are striving for. Next up, we have Heather Dane. Heather is the Family Engagement Specialist for the Bureau of Developmental Disability Services. She's gonna be talking about setting the stage for the future. That's gonna be on Tuesday, July the 28th from 12 o'clock to one o'clock. She will be talking about the life course framework, and how you can use the life course framework to really set the stage for the future and to figure out what kind of things you need to be working on. I think the life course framework is fabulous. If you're not familiar with it, even if you are familiar with it, Heather's presentation is fabulous. I guarantee you'll learn something. She's an amazing presenter. And then our final presentation of this series is Ms. Carly Shertino Poulter, and Carly is the director of the ARC Advocacy Network, and she's going to talk about restoring dignity and self-determination by charting the life course. So she's going to kind of build on what Heather talked about. Uh, that is on Thursday, July the 30th, and that's 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., and she's going to be talking about the dignity of risk um, and, and really how we, how we let go and, and really encourage our loved ones to be more independent and why that's so important. So that is our presentation, um, our conference schedule. And I hope, that, um, I hope that you guys found that helpful and interesting. And I'm really excited that you have signed up to attend the conference. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. You all have my email address. And if you don't, it's Garner, G-A-R-N-E-R, -E at dsindiana.org. Thank you so much, and I hope that you have a wonderful day.